Hello everyone and welcome to today's panel, Race, Nutrition and Obesity, part of the Food Security in the Americas series, made possible with the generous support of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies and the Department of History of Science at Harvard. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that we are recording today's webinar and it will be available on the Dr. Kloss YouTube channel shortly after today's session. There is a link in the chat to Dr. Kloss's calendar for other events. My name is Gabriela Sotolaviaga, and I am Professor of the History of Science and Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico in the History of Science Department. In the fall of 2020, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that even moderately excess weight could increase the odds of experiencing severe COVID-19. This was especially concerning because as the New York Times reported, 40% of US adults are considered obese with an additional 30% who are simply overweight. Put differently, the United States has some of the highest obesity rates in the world. But that statement does not reveal the full story. According to the CDC, 49.6 of non-Hispanic Blacks are obese, followed by Hispanic adults at 44.8% and non-Hispanic Whites at 42.2%. These numbers, divided by race, should make us pause and reflect. These percentages, as our speakers will address in their talks, are much more complicated than what the numbers disclose. As obesity rates continue to climb across the Americas, Questions of race, labor, and class, and their link to diet and nutrition need to be understood to give us a broader landscape of this growing and troubling trend. Today's panel will give us three examples of how they have approached questions of race and class and obesity in their own work, and what their research means for understanding the rates mentioned above. The way this panel is structured is that each presenter will talk for about 10 minutes, I will then open the conversation up with a couple of questions, and then we will open up to questions from the audience. And you can place your questions in the Q&A tab. And with that, let us begin. Our first speaker, Gerardo Otero, is Professor of International Studies at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. His work is on the political economy of agriculture and food, civil society, and the state in the Americas. He has published over 100 scholarly articles, chapters, and books. He is the author of Farewell to the Peasantry, Political Class Formation in Rural Mexico, reissued in 2018. His latest monograph is The Neoliberal Diet, Healthy Profits, Unhealthy People, from the University of Texas Press, published in 2018. In 2020, Otero was elected Vice President and President-elect of the Latin American Studies Association, the world's largest professional association for individuals and institutions engaged in the study of Latin America. Today, he will be speaking about the neoliberal diet and inequality. Thank you for joining us. Gerardo. Thanks very much for the invitation, Gabriela, and thank you, Mauricio, for the logistics. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen. And uh, uh, this is the cover of my latest book, but I don't have to do the informational about it. I'll go right straight to the talk um, because we don't have that much time. So um, what is the neoliberal diet? I mean, I, I've labeled the neoliberal diet uh, uh, to refer to this globalized version of the industrial diet, which emerged in the United States in the 1940s. It is made up of energy dense, uh, ultra processed food. Uh, I divide it into luxury and basic foods and there is no prejudice as to whether one or the other is more or less nutritious. All that uh, these labels have to do is with access, you know, more or less access to food. I mean, luxury foods are less accessible, basic foods are more accessible. And it so happens that the more uh, basic foods are now becoming more energy dense. And there's, I mean, the whole agricultural model that these foods are predicated on is uh, petrochemical use intensive. So um, 
I'm going to be referring to two kinds of inequality through my talk. Uh, one is uh, what you might call in interstate inequality between Mexico and its northern neighbors, and then uh, class inequality within Mexico. So in terms of uh, interstate inequality, uh, one of the main questions in the early 1990s was, uh, uh, what was going to happen with this association of Mexico and its uh, much wealthier northern neighbors? Was there going to be a, an upward convergence to US levels of uh, standard of living, or a downward convergence toward Mexico, or perhaps some kind of divergence? Well, the data on per capita real domestic product tell us that there has continued to be this convergence between Canada and the United States, but Mexico's uh, GDP per capita has remained basically flat. Now, if we break that down uh, between uh, the labor share of the gross domestic product and capital share of the gross domestic product, I think we can get another picture uh, uh, about this. Uh, I've equaled uh, 1994 uh, share to 100, and then you know determined, and this is with data from the Federal Reserve uh, Economic Database. Uh, so what we see here is a couple of things. One is that U.S. workers did experience a bit of a bump in the uh, late 1990s up until 2002. After that, even U.S. workers' share of the gross domestic product declined. And so the, uh, it was the same case for Canada and much worse for Mexico. Um, so what about food performance in North America? Well, I mean, this is also, and I'm starting with, you know, the very large data, and I'm going to be going into more concrete stuff. So uh, this is data that goes from 1961 to 2013. That's all the database at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And there are a couple of interesting uh, trends here. Uh, the yellow line here is for the world average uh, kilocalories per capita per day. And so what you see here about Mexico is that it was uh, moving away from the world average up toward the north, uh, the U US level. It almost reached the US level in 1981 at a time when Mexico had this uh, program to uh, try to achieve food self-sufficiency. After that came the uh, foreign debt crises uh, and then came neoliberalism. And after that, Mexico's food intake remain mostly flat, uh, while that for Canada and the US continue to go up. So a big puzzle is, why is it that, you know, with a basically flat food intake, Mexico has become the second most obese country in the world? And I'm going to argue that it doesn't have as much to do with the quantity of calories, but with the quality of calories. And I think this graph tells us a little bit of that story. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, compar a comparison with the world's average in terms of the percentage of proteins coming from vegetable products per capita. And so what we see here is that in the earlier period, Mexico was well above the world average in uh, uh, vegetable proteins. That turned around in the 1970s, and it continued to go down uh, as uh, time progressed. It was the opposite for Canada. Uh, I guess Canada is the only country that has done better. Uh, the US uh, uh, line is also mostly flat. So uh, again, I mean, these are averages, per capita averages. So let me try to break this down a little bit. So here, what I have is a comparison between 1980 and 2013 on which were the top eight food caloric sources. And again, these are averages of kilocalories per capita per day. Uh, so we see a few, a few trends here, uh, a decline in the consumption of maize, an increase in sugars, very important for obesity, a decline in wheat, decline in milk, decline in pork, compensated by a considerable increase in poultry and 
soybean oils, and also a decline in beans consumption. Uh, how do they build this? Inductively, you know, I just went into the uh, FAO site. I got, uh, you know, the, the total caloric contribution from about a hundred different food sources, and I picked the top eight in each case. Okay, so <clears throat> let's break these down a little bit. So what we have here is the share of household income spent on food. And what I did, and this is data from the Mexico's uh, National Institute for uh, Statistics, Geography and Informatics. Uh, they give you the data in terms of deciles, which are 10 chunks of 10% each of the income distribution. I recategorize those into the poorest 10%, the 11 to 50% medium poor, I'm not sure about the names here, but uh, the 51 to 90% medium rich, and then the 10% richest. So perhaps the most remarkable thing that we can see in this graph is that in all of these income groups, they had to spend more on food as time went by between 2002 and 2018. And that's not good, because if you compare with data from the United States, there has been a continuous decline in the share of household income spent on food. All right, so Mexico is going in the wrong direction, and I would argue that that has to do with Mexico's increased dependency on importing food, particularly from the United States. So let me move into what this inequality means in terms of uh, what people have access to. So here we have the top five luxury food expenditures uh, where we define the richest decile, the richest 10% as equal to 100%. And so the question is, how much are the other income groups spending in food relative to that 100% of the richest uh, decile? And uh, how did I define these particular foods? Well, I asked myself, uh, for which were the foods where the poorest were not spending even 50% of the richest, of what the richest spent on this, all right? And so you, you can see that in no cases, the blue bar reaches 50%. So milk, alcoholic beverages, vegetables, beef, and fish. Now, I asked a similar question for the basic foods. And here's what we got. These are the top five basic food expenditures. And once again, in relation to the richest decile. Uh, and something that is kind of appalling is the fact that tortillas, you know, all the other income groups spend a considerable amount more in absolute terms in tortillas than the richest decile here. Uh, we see a similar phenomenon with regard to beans. I mean, the, the, the poorest spend more on beans than uh, the intermediary or the medium categories here. And uh, the same goes for tubers or potatoes, uh, at least with regard to the first uh, or the, the second uh, group, and definitely for sugars. So, I think this uh, gives us a, an image of how skewed the uh, income inequality, how it helps skew income uh, food choices toward the most energy dense kinds of, of foods. One minute. So, okay, I'm at my concluding uh, slide here. My conclusion is that the middle upper and upper classes are eating more meat, fruit, and vegetables. Uh, most of those tend to be on the healthier side. And I put wine in parentheses because I haven't substantiated that, but I, I have a strong suspicion. Let's put it uh, as a hypothesis. And then the lower and middle income classes, uh, they access more energy dense foods and beer. And I also have some indirect data about that. So ultimately, it's uh, structure, not choice, that matters. And uh, 
by saying this, I'm really countering the mainstream interpretations of uh, food and nutrition in North America, which tend to argue that people can vote with their forks, they can change the world you know, by their food choices. It's not really a matter of individual choice for the vast majority of the population, I would argue. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Otero, for that wonderful presentation. And I think this last point that you make that the question of choice, structure versus choice, is one that we're going to carry through, I, I'm certain, through to the, the conversation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Janet Barragan Miranda, a postdoctoral fellow for academic diversity in the Department of History at American University. Her book project, whoops. Let's see, sorry about that. Her book project, Hungering for Equality, explores responses from experts, social workers, and ordinary people ignited by the expose of hunger in the United States during the 1960s. She's currently working on an article about the history of food boycotts culminating in the 1969 White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. She holds a PhD in Chicana and Chicano Studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She will be speaking on eating proper and the racialization of Mexican food in the United States. Thank you so much, Dr. Barragan Miranda. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Gabriela. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me um, and to Gabriela and Mauricio for your help. Um, the title of my presentation is Proper Eating and the Racialization of Mexican Food in the United States. And today I will talk about efforts that targeted Mexican food and habits as unhealthy and as a detriment to the community of Mexican origin during the 1960s. So to understand how the rhetoric about obesity as we see it today connected to Mexicans um, and more generally to the Latinx population, uh, I position it as a tradition in the US to connect eating habits with malnourishment, which goes back to the mid 20th century and centers hunger. Eating Mexican food, as well as eating while Mexican, signaled the cause for malnourishment rather than the socioeconomic circumstances the community often faced. This allows us to see how food functioned as a tool to racialize the community, particularly at a time when race was being characterized, uh, in a sh was shifting the way that race was characterized out of Jim Crow and into more covert ways of defining race. So the same foods that appeared to nourish Mexicans like beans, tortillas, salsas would become harmful to health once those foods crossed the border and were consumed under a United States context. So during the post-World War II era, examples in popular culture identified food um, as identified um, food and the kitchen as sites of modernity. Kitchen appliances sped up the process of providing nourishment, fast food and frozen meals catered to busier lifestyles and uh, products like saran wrap and Tupperware paired with refrigerators to encourage leftovers. Overall, inventions in the kitchen formulated a cultural shift in the way that Americans ate. The post-World War II era also saw economic growth and a booming middle class. This would shadow the constant existence of poverty in America because you see, poverty was not wiped out when World War II pushed the United States into becoming a superpower. Throughout the country, people continued to struggle to feed their families, and they often lived adjacent to that glowing middle class. And as the decade of the 1960s opened, so did the expose of hunger. Documentary films uh, about the pervasiveness of hunger during the decade and an array of reports, including Hungry Children, the Senate Committee on Hunger, uh, the War on Poverty, and Michael Harrington books, uh, Michael Harrington's book, The Other America, which put the faces of and detailed the stories of life in poverty for um, a number of Americans during this decade of the, of the 1960s. So here you have some of these examples. So in this era, when modernity in the kitchen signaled the progressive state and the nation, uh, in the nation and the ever presence of poverty brought shame, we are able to see how ethnic foods, and in this case, Mexican food, actually contributed to the socially constructed characteristics about Mexican people. So teaching 
people of Mexican origin about how to eat properly was not a new practice in the 1960s. Some historians like Vicki Reese and George Sanchez have referred to the 1929 publication, Americanization Through Homemaking, for directly targeting Mexican culture as the root of any tribulations in the community. And for my purposes, I focus on the chapter titled Food um, in the handbook, which shows this image here on the left of a boy and it states the noon lunch, quote, the noon lunch of the Mexican child quite often consists of a folded tortilla with no filling. There is no milk or fruit to whet the appetite. As eh, such a lunch is not conducive to learning, the child becomes lazy, his hunger unappeased, he watches for an opportunity to take food from the lunch boxes of more fortunate children. Thus the initial step in a life of thieving is taken end quote, all because of a tortilla, presumably without a filling. The handbook was circulated in Mexican American barrios from El Paso, Texas to Los Angeles, California, targeting Mexican women. These women were reminded that the stakes were, were high when preparing a school lunch for their children. The chapter food, um, there are recipes of American foods ranging from soups and appetizers to main dishes and desserts. These recipes are woven with messages about the responsibility of Mexican women to take, to upkeep their home and in order to um, keep their family from a life of crime, particularly this section um, that is titled Nutrition and Crime. Um, and up here, you can see some of those recipes that I referred to. The ubiquity of controlling what Mexicans ate in the US is perhaps most remarkable as hunger allowed the general public and experts, including nutritionists, dietitians, economists, and even policymakers to both emblematically and literally enter into the private homes of poor people and, um, and attempt to decipher the reason why hunger existed, often pointing to cultural national origin as the root of the problem. In 1960, the documentary um, Harvest of Shame, one of, uh, one of the co county commissioners was interviewed um, in San Antonio, Texas. His name was AJ Plough. And he was interviewed about the pre prevalence of hunger in the city. Um, the, commissioner uh, the commissioner's interview followed a segment where, um, where the, the segment that was inside of the home of a Mexican American family where they discussed malnourishment of children in San Antonio. In his interview, the commissioner stated that hunger would always exist because Mexican men refused to work, emphasizing that um, there were plenty of jobs in the city, but Mexican men would not take any work. The interview also made clear that hunger carried much heavier weight than not having enough to eat. For the commissioner, hunger was the result of laziness, a problem that he stated should not be left unto taxpayers to resolve. Mexican heritage often um, led experts to apply their preconceived notions of the community and to opaque the circumstances that had. One nutritionist, Julie Erickson, stated in a 1969 interview with the Los Angeles Times that in her work with Mexicans, she, quote, has seen no children suffering from a lack of food, but plenty who are suffering from too much. If we have a problem here, it is obesity, end quote. Erickson was part of a pilot program implemented in East Los Angeles that aimed to bring experts to inform the predominantly Mexican origin population about healthy eating. Instead, she placed a lot of heavy judgment on her participants without surveying the community. She explains that the Mexican diet is innately heavy in carbohydrates. And when they adapt to American diets, people of Mexican origin tended to eat the foods that were um, high in carbohydrates like cakes. Erickson's method of approaching the community, uh, approaching these communities, she said, was to integrate healthy American foods like fruits and vegetables. The article concludes that, quote, the unbalanced diets which she, Erickson, witnessed in East Los Angeles reflect not so much poverty as, as ignorance of good eating habits. Erickson pointed to carb heavy items like tortillas, rice, beans, and uh, fideos or vermicelli pasta as central to a Mexican diet without accounting for the fact that these food items have a long shelf life do not require refrigeration and are filling. 
Furthermore, the newspaper took Erickson's word to be fact when she referred to the children of East Los Angeles as having too much to eat and being obese without uh, any pragmatic evidence to su substantiate um, her claim. In my research, I have found examples that use Mexican cultural habits as placeholders or as placeholders for racializing the community. Often holding Mexican women accountable for the pervasiveness of hunger, I have found that hunger, particularly efforts to expose hunger and to end hunger, have much to offer us in the way that the experts imagined proper ways of eating, often obscured by racialized ideas of who the Mexican population was and the actual circumstances on the ground that created um, challenges for healthy nutrition. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barragan Miranda, for that wonderful talk to really make us think about food as a function to racialize a community, but also the cultural links of how hunger and its definition is, is really uh, defined and created. Um, as our final panelist, I just want to remind the panelists to hold off in answering the questions. I know that many questions are coming in. We will have a Q&A from, uh, from the audience. So hold your seats, we will get to those. So uh, our final uh, speaker is Dr. Emily Yates Adour, Adour, sorry, an assistant professor of anthropology at Oregon State University and the University of Amsterdam. She studies health systems, food justice, and social inequality. She's currently writing a book on the social history of Guatemala's Ventana de los Mil Días, The Window of a Thousand Days a maternal health program, which entails collaboration with health and human development experts in Guatemala. Her previous book, The Weight of Obesity, Hunger and Global Health in Postwar Guatemala, traced the emergence of public health concern for obesity in Guatemala's highlands. Um, today, she will be speaking about from BMI to stunting, the problem of and with food security in Guatemala. And I will actually be sharing her presentation because there were some connectivity issues. So we are going to, uh, hold on. She was gracious enough to put it on YouTube for us. The problem of and with food security in Guatemala. About a decade ago, toward the end of my research on the rising diagnosis of obesity in Guatemala, I began to accompany health extension workers on their visits to a cluster of rural Mayamon communities in the Western Highlands. The region had been prioritized because of its high rates of poverty and malnutrition. It's a place devastated by colonialism made worse by recent trade agreements. Water systems have collapsed, climate crisis has made growing cycles unpredictable, if not impossible, and soils are covered in chemical fertilizers and pesticides in desperate attempts to make food grow. Conservative estimates are that one in five people have left for the United States. Mm -hmm. Public health experts were telling me that obesity was a lost cause in the present. To make an impact on obesity, they said the field of public health needed to improve nutrition during what is called a critical window of physiological development in early life. The health extension workers traveled to teach pregnant and breastfeeding women how to eat correctly, handing out nutrition supplements to also improve their diets. These were given with the warning that what women did or did not eat during pregnancy might eventually cause their children to suffer from poor health and poor cognition. Brain development is an important piece of this story. In the city hospital, elderly women would stand on scales to have their BMI calculated. In the rural clinic, women's babies would be stretched out on long boards, the measure of their length recorded on their child's growth chart, which tracked their growth alongside global reference standards. Head circumference was frequently collected as well. Before dismissing the mothers, health workers would warn them about stunting and all the negative consequences that their two small children would face. In the background of this shifting focus from BMI and weight to stunting is the rollout of the UN Sustainable Development Goals with its metric-based approach to global health. Zero hunger is the second goal of the SDGs and the first 10 years of this new era of development has been called the decade of action on nutrition with nutrition prioritized across all 17 goals. Hunger is a politically powerful rhetorical device but it is also a quote messy problem as one health expert called it. 
What she meant was that to be useful in global rankings of hunger, which were necessary for prioritizing the allocation of limited resources, hunger must be rendered in a way that it can be compared across different aggregate groups, for example, country or gender or ethnic identification. The public health community has largely avoided using the term race, but a point that I'll make at the end of the talk is that race haunts these categories. Today, global health experts have solved the messiness of hunger with stunting, which offers a seemingly clear-cut means of quantification. Used interchangeably with chronic malnutrition and chronic hunger, the term has a technical and broadly agreed upon definition referring to the condition of being two standard deviations below median growth for age. The underlying idea is that much like rings on a tree, bone growth forms a linear record, an archaeology of living conditions. Children who are well fed grow taller. Those who are two standard deviations below the reference curves are marked as stunted. Mm. The WHO makes clear that the reference standards describe normal child growth from birth to five years under optimal environmental conditions and can be applied to all children everywhere, regardless of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and type of feeding. The implications of this brief statement are tremendous. As a normative description, it makes the claim that populations everywhere should be the same height, and deviation from the norm is a sign that something in the environment is wrong, and this thing that is wrong has manifested in the body, what some experts have called a biology of poverty. I'm fast forwarding through a lot, but today in global health conversations about food security, the term stunting is everywhere. Mm -hmm. When the World Bank loaned Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales $100 million for his newly launched nutrition campaign, Crecer Sano, Niñez con Futuro, or the Grow Up Healthy Project, this was justified by the fact that Guatemala is the world's sixth most stunted country according to World Bank rankings. Crecer Sano was not just a catchy slogan. Growth rates were driving the World Bank's funding and growth rates would be used to determine whether the nutrition campaign was a success. In Guatemala and throughout the Americas, biological growth has become the linchpin to development. The World Bank's Regional Vice President for Latin America, Axel von Trotzenberg, explained the stakes of deviation from the global growth norms in Guatemala as follows, and I'm going to summarize. He says, in Guatemala, poverty affects half the population. There's a million children under the age of five who suffer from chronic malnutrition or stunting, jeopardizing not just their future, but the future of society. Then in a rhetorical maneuver that's become commonplace, he linked skeletal growth to the growth of the brain, warning that being small had an impact on intellectual capacity and overall fitness. He says children suffering from malnutrition are at increased risk for dying. They experience physical and cognitive constraints because they have 40% less structural brain development once they've reached their first year of life. And this is counted as conception, which is an interesting note in all of this. Um, he says that they learn more slowly, they earn less from their labor, and they're at greater risk of suffering from chronic illnesses. This picture here, shown by Jim Young Kim at a meeting at the Gates Foundation, is characteristic of the kind of imagery that is being used to describe stunted brains right now. At a meeting of Gates Foundation funded researchers and Guatemalan nutrition scientists held in Guatemala City, one of the scientists raised his hand to ask what U.S. researchers plan to do about the fact that stunting is a normative word and that carrying out research on stunting risks stigmatizing an entire society. Quote, the problem is not being small, he said. What made you small is the problem, but that message is hard to parse and deliver. He continued, nodding to, toward a group of women nutrition scientists in attendance. I think a lot of people in this room are sensitive towards stigmatization and conflicted about how to give public health messaging around stunting. You should anticipate how your research results will be interpreted in many ways for political reasons, among others. In interrogating racism, Leith Mullings writes that the consolidation of an exploitable label market required by global capitalism has created, quote, new forms of racialization. She is in conversation with Cedric Robertson, who argues that a key tendency of Euro-American capitalism has been not to homogenize, but to differentiate, to exaggerate regional, subcultural, and dialectical differences into racial ones. What is widely thought of as race, even if the word is not named explicitly, does not only point to differences in skin color to often offer a common understanding of race, but to a broader technique of weighing and valuing a person's worth through embodied difference. Their comments help us to see the resurging interest in anthropometry of bodies and heads as the reappearance of one of the oldest techniques of race making and ultimately as a mechanism of racial capitalism. These logics of biological inferiority both produce inequality as a problem in bodies and hold this problem in place. I just referred to logics of biology. 
In the longer work, I insist upon biologics of poverty instead of biologies of poverty to slow down the assumption that poverty manifests in impoverished biologies. Buffon, Galton, even Boas have in different ways deployed anthropometric explanations for poverty, but there are deep white supremacist histories of scientific racism that have made it possible to think of poverty as made manifest in flesh and bone. At a time when the global health community is working to legitimize interest in the size of people's heads, naturalizing correlations between height and cognition, the aim of this short talk has been to push back against the discriminatory biologics of poverty in which a high percentage of babies in mostly poor and indigenous communities are thought to be born less intelligent and less fit than others. In the face of endless pictures of stunted neurons and stunted brains that are supposedly the result of early life malnutrition, I'm reminded of the work of Tressie McMillan Cotton, who writes, smart is only a construct of correspondence between one's abilities, one's environment, and one's moment in history. I am smart in the right way, in the right time, on the right end of globalization. Ultimately, when it comes to repairing poverty, biologics may have little to offer. Instead, we might keep our attention focused on the structures that willfully, knowingly produce poverty, that benefit from it and do not want it to end. Consider that the laws surrounding the US-Guatemala border actively draw parents and children into indentured servitude and deeply corrupt for-profit visa systems and bail bonds, leaving families suffocating under crushing debt that furthers the cycle of migration or that huge corporate profits are made selling corn-based supplements in indigenous communities who can no longer afford to grow their own corn, or that the futures of indigenous children are foreclosed by a systematic defunding of schools, forcing students into classrooms without teachers or supplies, even as they are told that this is the quintessential space for learning and that their own knowledges and forms of education are backward and wrong. Audra Simpson reminds us that these stories about poverty are also stories of stolen wealth. They have everything to do with the traumatic violence against indigenous people and that this violence was historically bolstered, not prevented by the science of measuring bodies and heads. My overall concern is that attention towards stunting, much like that of BMI, becomes used as justification for the poverty of indigenous Guatemalan people, upholding the very structures of privilege and exploitation that it claims to work against. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Emily, for that really uh, equally powerful presentation. And were you reminding us that standardization, it's not just for measures, but that hunger is a messy problem. And how to eat correctly is such a loaded question and a goal. So um, before we begin taking questions from the audience, I would like to pose a question to all panelists. And this question has to do about social in inequity and food, which all of you touched on in your presentations. Could you tell us what does your research on diet and obesity tell us about how we think about or should be thinking about social inequality, about the construction of appropriate diets? How about if we start with um, you, Gerardo? Uh, could you rephrase the question? Sure. Um, the question is about social in, in, inequality in food. What does your research on diet and obesity tell us about how we think about or should be thinking about social inequality, about the construction about, of appropriate diets? Yeah, uh, well, I guess my main point is that uh, an individual focus is not the right focus because uh, I mean, if that is what's going to lead to interventions, you know, trying to educate people into eating better, that's not going to cut it because uh, as long as people don't have enough income to buy the right food, you know, and many times people know what's good for them and what's not, but a lot of the time they simply can't afford uh, better food. And I mean, some of the people in the questions have mentioned, for instance, uh, women in the labor force. That's actually one of the, um, of the indicators that I use to construct my uh, neoliberal diet risk index. And not because I, I would like to perpetuate women's role in the household by any stretch of the imagination, but if women have been launched into the labor market, there would have to be 
additional measures like you know excellent uh, daycare and so on and so forth uh, to compensate because you know otherwise women have to bear the, the double burden of labor and then uh, household work as well and you know with much less time maybe they just have to buy tv dinners and stuff like that you're muted uh, Gabriela. Uh, thank you so much Gerardo. i think the question of gender is one that came up really prominently in all the talks as well but let's give a chance to janet to answer that question yeah, um, I think that in in my work, when I, I wanted to find out or at the beginning really wanted to understand this connection with being at risk, like at risk of obesity in the present state and how that has been constructed. And it took me back in history because um, when we're talking about hunger and um, when policymakers are talking about hunger, it's synonymous in how they're talking about it. if you just replace the word hunger, it's very similar to how um, people will talk about obesity today. Um, and some of that is also, um, it, it, it rings a bell with how youth are talked about, at-risk youth, right? And all of that is, is kind of related to this um, fear of what's gonna happen if you cross the line of hunger or if you cross to, to become malnourished, um, either obese or, or hungry, um, what kind of, of weight that, that has on society and then um, public assistance and things like that. Um, so yeah, how people are talked about very much has to do with um, their social inequality position that they're in. Um, but what I'm also really interested in is how people respond to that. So what were community members doing to respond to that? And what kind of power do people have? Um, and how did they confront each other, the experts, the implementers, and then the community? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. And Emily? Yes, and thanks to the panelists. I hope that this connection isn't too bad. Um, so I think the focus on diet or, bio or biology, um, which is so often a focus on women's behavior, it helps obfuscate these histories of scientific racism and genocide. And I mean this quite literally that almost none of the dozens or maybe hundreds of scientific papers that I've read about stunting in Guatemala with a few exceptions, particularly um, the, the, the papers that are coming out of US and US science, uh, none of them make reference to racism or genocide. And I think that this wrinkle in public health projects that are designed that seem to seem to be improving um, life conditions among indigenous women by focusing on what women are eating. And this, this was a um, point that was made so well in the presentation before mine um, is, is the fact that actually in Guatemala, indigenous women are hurt for their survival. They're hurt for their survivance and their success. And that there's a lot of people in political and economic power that don't actually want to see women thrive. So just to sum that up, you know, food matters, but I think a far more com powerful conversation than diet is dispossession. And if we start to talk about land sovereignty and land reform, I think that moves us to more quickly see how poverty and racism and vulnerability are, are, are actually, um, uh, that, well, they're not bugs in the system, but they're features of global capitalism, to use a phrase that Ruha Benjamin has, has used. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. I wanted to ask you something because this is something that you all touched on, and it's a question on metrics. Each of your research projects illustrates how nutritional metrics are used to characterize both food and bodies, transforming them into something that can be studied or quantified. While this data is valuable, what are some of the pitfalls making nutritional generalizations about certain groups? What is left out? And I think, Emily, in your presentation, this is where it came out the clearest. I was wondering if you could elaborate more from, from your presentation, and then we'll turn to Janet. Sure. Um, so one of the claims that's, and I find this really interesting about metrics, is that the claim made by global health practitioners is that anthropometric measurements offer this proof of inequality that we need in order to um, know where to fairly allocate resources. So people will talk about stunting. Actually, we need to know this for social justice purposes as much of the language that comes out of um, many of the global health experts. Um, and I can see the argument here that the simplicity of stunting metrics, um, you know, is useful, it can be uh, leveraged to make people in power pay attention to these problems of, um, that they might not otherwise pay attention to. Um, but I, you know, what I see actually is, is um, just, you know, wrapped into the seemingly simple metrics are these very living histories of phrenology and fitness and IQ in which violence is upheld in the name 
of doing good. And, you know, I think it, for, for me watching this happen play out with BMI, which is now, you know, so widely recognized to be a pretty useless measure um, among um, many health experts, you know, watching kind of the same debates happening over, um, you know, size, you know, I think that what, what what's happening is that there is a, um, desire on the part of ad, uh, health workers to advocate for health um, uh, head circumferences to be measured as kind of a stand, standard clinical measure. And this idea that head size is a proxy for cognitive function is really normalized in some, or it, you know, there's this push to normalize that. And I think that um, it's really important for us to push back against that by bringing attention to these racist, the histories of scientific racism and um, to really call attention to, to the kind of um, histories that I think are still living in the in the measurements that are used today. Thank you so much for that, Emily. And Janet and Gerardo, did you want to add something, Janet, first? Yeah, so um, definitely. Um, metrics are a part of how um, some of the menus, the budget menus or the value menus were constructed to have, um, you know, for food stamps programs or different programs that encouraged people or had um, some menus where people could, you know, here's how you're going to eat on under a dollar a day or something like that. Um, and, and they also worked to create the foodstuff packages that would be um, in the WIC, women, infants and children's programs, things like that. And at some point they have these huge pitfalls because when people were only eating supplemental food that was given in these um, packages stamped by the USDA, sometimes they would, their children could die and have uh, these awful um, diseases because they were massively malnourished. And the program simply said, well, it was supposed to be supplemental to a diet. It wasn't supposed to replace the diet, right? It, that's, that's the fine print. And I think that sometimes where metrics um, have a stamp of approval by the government or by these big agencies, um, people gain a, a sort of, um, they, they rely on them or they, they, they think that these, these um, foodstuffs are enough subsistence when at, at times they're not. And this, this will become a huge problem. This is another reason, right? Another reason why people feel uncomfortable with information that comes about health from um, the higher ups or the government or something like that, right? Um, from policy, um, because they've been told, uh, they've been geared in different directions. And so that's how I see metrics in my, in my work a little bit. Thank you so much, Janet. And Canardo, did you wanna add something about metrics in, in your own work? Um. Well, I mean, there's been a, a criticism of, and somebody mentioned it in the questions about the BMI, the body mass index. And I mean, there's a long debate about, you know, whether uh, it's good or, or bad. I think it's, it's probably not very good to measure things at the individual level, but I think it's okay. And it's about as, as good as we have to measure populations. And why not at the individual level? Because, uh, you would miss people like bodybuilders, for instance, you know, they might appear to be obese, but they have very little fat. So that, that the BMI would be deceiving in that case, but that may be more of an exception. And so I, I think, uh, you know, it, the body mass index is, uh, is not a bad measurement, I would say, for the general population level. Oh, that's interesting because I think what Janet was just saying is that BMI, she finds it troubling in her historical work. And Emily, if I, so that's, it's interesting um, to think about these different measures at different times. So um, that, that's wonderful that um, we can continue that conversation about different ways of perceiving this particular metric. Um, I want one final question before we turn to these many, many questions. Um, and this uh, that we have in the queue, but today, what is for you the most pressing issue when you speak about race, diet, and obesity? Uh, how about if we start with you, Janet? Yeah, I think it goes back to what I just mentioned, which is that um, in, the history, in the history of this relationship between hunger um, the expose of hunger and how people related to it is the mistrust that was created. Um, and then when we go into the 1980s, it becomes the buzzword is, is now obesity. It's no longer hunger, but it's still a form of malnourishment. And so I think that um, 
one of the more pressing issues is to uncover what, um, how long has this been happening? How long have we been racializing people um, based on hunger, malnourishment, um, obesity, and then to see how that affects communities' relationship to um, other entities um, like different assistance programs or um, relationship to policy and things like that that have to do with public health um, because we are in a situation where now people have a distrust um, that that is spreading in different spaces, I think. So super, thank you. Um, Gerardo, what would that be for you? What is the most pressing issue when we speak about race, diet, and obesity? Oh, you're muted. Thanks. Yeah, there was an article in the New York Times uh, a few months ago, uh, citing a professor from the University of California, Santa Cruz, I think, uh, when she said that it was not race, but slavery in the case of, uh, you know, how a lot of uh, black Americans, uh, you know, are very susceptible as, as well as uh, uh, Mexican American or Hispanic American, Latino, Latina, uh, to, to the COVID crisis. And I mean, my sense is that, uh, I mean, there is obviously a, a huge weight of racism in a society like the United States, but I think there is a, a confounding of, I mean, the really root cause is that racism placed people at an economic disadvantage, but it is the economic disadvantage that causes them to not have access to nutritious food. Thank you so much, Gerardo. And Emily, did you want to add something before we turn to the Q&A? Sure. So um, people talk about global warming and climate migration as something that's coming. And I think it's true that it will likely get a lot worse, but the catastrophe is already here. And we have um, you know, news today, 15,000 children being held in migration, US migration centers, 5,000 in jail, many who've been there for weeks on end, all while we have a cl closed migration system. And I think opening borders will help some people who may be ignoring this face the magnitude of the devastation of global capitalism um, before it's late. And I think it's these kinds of conversations. So I skipped this little section in the talk for time, but um, when I tried to talk with women in Highland Guatemala about anthropometrics, um, for the most part, midwives would occasionally talk to me. They, um, and these are women that have a lot of knowledge of metrics. They're expert weavers. They handle international finances and currency con exchanges. So it's not metrics that, that are the problem, but they did not want to be talking about body metrics. And I think taking a cue from them, um, I don't think that we, in many ways, you know, that we should be talking about um, the problem of Latin American obesity or the problem of Latin American stunting. And th this is where the, the title of the talk of my talk of the problem of and with food security comes from. Um, I think much of the problem is a framing problem. And at least part of the, the aim here is to take away some of the power from conversations that are focused on women's bodies and behaviors and to put um, power in logics of poverty that may more effectively inspire the kinds of political revolution that we need to achieve poverty's end. Absolutely, Emily, that, that's, that's really wonderful. So I'm gonna start taking questions from the audience to carry this conversation, especially what Emily just left us with in terms of how we can change the actual framing of this conversation. And we'll start with a question from June Ehrlich. And she begins by telling you, these are wonderful presentations. And she's wondering if looking at the last couple of decades, if we are not only looking at shifts in what people eat, but how they eat it. I'm thinking of things like more women in the workforce, less time in workplaces for traditional lunch, television and social media campaigns for snacking and fast food. And before um, uh, whomever wants to take this question, just a reminder that we have about 15 minutes left and we have close to 20 questions. So if you can be brief, so we can get to as many questions as possible. Who would like to answer this one? If you could just raise your hand, because I can't see. Janet, was that you? Yeah, I can, I can talk to this. Um, so um, one of the things that I, I look at is about how people ate in general, but also, um, so sometimes, sometimes it appears that when um, people have busier lifestyles, right, and they're using fast food, 
um, particularly white women, if they're consuming, they're, they're buying fast food in the 1960s and 70s, um, it's seen a little bit or a lot different um, than when women of color start purchasing fast food for their families, because then it's a detriment to how they're feeding their family. And that's what I like really want to open up and think about. Um, how is it different in, a, in one context, in one household than it is in the other, right? Fast food helps um, um, some women to um, have that busier lifestyle, have that career. And for other women, they are putting poison into their family. So that's um, how I kind of explore that idea of, you know, how we eat too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, I want to go now to Kelly Bianchi. She's um, thinking as well for the presentation. She says, in what ways do federal nutrition programs contribute to the structural problems in accessing healthy foods? In what ways do federal nutrition programs contribute to the structural problems in accessing healthy foods? This actually seems to be up your alley, Janet, but in case yeah. somebody else wants to take that on. So Janet, why don't you go yeah. ahead? In the 1960s, um, some of the challenges were getting the actual food packages to people, for instance, right? There's a number of challenges, but one of them was actually getting food packages to people or um, if who were in rural areas or isolated areas or getting people to the welfare office to um, fill out the paperwork. And then um, there, were, there were a number of challenges, but that also shaped how people would um, respond or in that 1960s that cultural shifts and social shifts were changing and people were responding to um, say no we want food with dignity and in a different format right and we're gonna we're, we're the experts of how we, we're gonna get food um, here and what kind of nutrition we need in in our neighborhoods in in our households right and so um, a food assistance programs very much helped to shape both, right? Food assistance programs were shaped by community. In the 1970s, we see a ton of shifts in um, how uh, food stamps and WIC and all of those programs function. Um, so I think that there was something going on between both. Um, the programs were shaped by people and then um, people mm -hmm. also uh, ate and, and contributed to um, their culture of eating. So huge, um, huge contracts like Kraft, Welch's, Mott's, like all of those that trickled into the, the programs also shaped how the community would eat and what they would consider nutritious because um, of, of um, that relationship that there was to um, the food that was handed out through those programs. Um, so it was a didactic kind of relationship between food programs and the way that people ate. Thank you so much, Janet. I, I, the next question is for Emily, and it says, uh, how do we unstigmatize stunted growth? Do we see stunted growth to be higher for certain genders? So um, that's a question that some of the Guatemalan scientists that I work with are really grappling with, where they are trying to ask these questions of how do we have a kind of a, um, work against uh, this, these processes of stigmatization. Um, and I, I don't have a great answer for them. One of my kind of um, solutions is just to, you know, kind of stay away from the conversations altogether to, to shift frames and look elsewhere. Um, because I'm not, I'm not actually sure how you unstigmatize um, um, something like stunting. But I think that there probably is, um, when I'm also just thinking of people's, you know, kind of refusal to engage it. Um, there's some interesting, I can think of some interesting uh, work that's being done, but, um, but for me, you know, I would just, I would set the, set the, um, look elsewhere. There's a lot of other, other um, places that attention could be focused, so. Thank you Sorry. so much. We have a question for Gerardo. Oh, Gerardo, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just uh, an example on the other extreme. Uh, there was a law passed in, in France uh, to the effect that um, you know they, they were shaming overweight children so that they would eat better, and I mean you know that that's I guess one of the consequences of uh, having this individual focus for this problem and you know focusing at the micro sociological level uh, of shaming uh, overweight and I mean you know I think that's you know really very tragic. Great, and actually the next question is for you, um, 
So it is, uh, Dr. Otero, going off your point about subsidizing farmers and addressing in inequalities as a way to target structural issues at hand. How can we implement similar policies that address this double burden of malnutrition, but also obesity? Has your research found any type of intervention that can simultaneously address both of these extremes, malnutrition and obesity? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, I mean, one of the problems with US policy, I mean, that's not what I talked about, but uh, I think as far as I know for, with the US policy is that it is really shaped by uh, livestock producers. And so it is in their interest to have uh, corn and soybeans be very heavily subsidized because they become the raw material for feeding livestock. And so that tilts the whole food system into producing meat and away from producing fruits and vegetables. Uh, so, and I mean, if you compare the, the amounts of uh, meat that Americans eat with, I guess, most people in, in the South, it, it's huge. I mean, it's, you know, two or three times more. Uh, and that, that can be very unhealthy uh, for the environment, for people, you know, for everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I don't have any specific suggestions for combating undernutrition because my starting point in the research that I presented about today was uh, after observing that if in the 1970s and 80s, the core problem with food was uh, uh, undernourishment, uh, the problem as of the 1990s has been overnourishment uh, in the sense, I mean, it's still malnutrition, but in the sense of uh, overeating calories that are empty of nutrients. I'm not sure how to combat it. No. I think uh, you, we have to fix the agricultural system and we have to fix the income inequality. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Ali Gill, for the question. Um, we have a question from Alejandra Nava. In, uh, who says, I know BMI is very centric to people from European descent. Are there better biometrics for other people of different ethnicities? Janet, would you like to begin with that one? In my, um, I, I guess in my approach to, um, to BMI, I, I try to or think about um, how do we there's there's a thin line or some gray area between the BMI and then um, the actual nourishment of people and so I focus on how um, people are going to get food the types of foods they get things like that um, but in my research um, I yeah, in the 1960s, we're, we're engaging with BMI, but it's a lot, um, like Gerardo said, of this undernourishment. And so, and I think that um, there are some studies circulating around brain growth and um, some of the, uh, the information that Emily was also talking about. Um, but actually measuring wide, widespread BMI, I think until the nutrition the, the National Nutrition Survey of the 1980s that focused on Latinos or the Hispanic community, we don't really have, you know, so much of a, of a wide scale BMI, what that looked like for the population for, for Hispanic or Latina, Latinos um, during that 1960s era. So I'm really looking at the perception that they're underweight or the idea, the notion that they're malnourished um, because of how they eat culturally or some of their cultural habits or things like that, um, rather than, than having actual empirical evidence that supports that they're under or overnourished or something along those lines. Thank you so much, Janet. And we um, have a, a question that's uh, posed by two different people here, and it's for you, Emily, is um, if stunting is problematic, what metrics should we use or create in order to study and tackle nutrition problems? 
Is it a health problem or a justice problem? Asked Maria Castaneda. And on a similar vein, Arachu Castro asks, um, how would you replace the current measurement of children? There is ample evidence that stunting and exposure to adverse events during early childhood affects the brain structure in such a way that if the adverse events are not addressed in time, the child may not be able to learn according to their age and are at higher risk of chronic disease in adulthood and premature death. Um, so the question is similar. What are the uh, benefits for children to have their development monitored? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge push right now to um, monitor child growth. There's um, a lot of, it's actually, a lot of the research comes out of Guatemala from the 1960s. There's a, a longitudinal study of human capital that has shown that, you know, early life um, intervention makes this big difference. One of the things that's interesting, a lot of some of the scientists that were initially involved in this um, were there because they wanted to make a case for the importance of early childhood education. And an effect that I've heard people say from today talking about is forget early childhood education. That's already too late. If you've got to look at the womb, you know, it's like go, you, it's it's all happening. Or even the pre-pregnant mother. There's a lot of a lot of this that is about monitoring um, women in pregnancy. And what I see, and so I'm I can't speak to kind of what should happen in the world, but what I see in my field site is that there's, um, you know, all of this kind of biological attention focused on women's bodies and women um, with with the broader biopolitical situation that women are living in, you know, very, uh, where they're very ignored. So, you know, things that um, would actually make women's lives um, better schools. You know, I mean, one of the dangerous things about this, you, you have to intervene early in life is that it, it becomes used to say, you know, forget that it's already too late. You know, forget, forget caring about <laughs> children or forget caring about, um, you know, elderly women, because, you know, it's this, the pregnant body, it matters so much. And I find that there's a really, really dangerous um, kind of biologic. Um, I would also recommend the readings of uh, Alejandra Colom in Guatemala. Um, she's also written on this and, and um, has had some great things to say about that. About these, the potential other metrics to, to address. No, them. about some of the dangers of, of whose bodies in focusing on this uh, period, um, what you know? What what then happens to women and whose bodies then get ignored or overlooked, or what kinds of problems? I mean, the the issue is what sorts of problems um, get you know actually overlooked. And and I see a lot of you know supposed care in these anthropometrics, but actually not a lot of structural support for um, the women that are you know supposedly uh, there to benefit from these nutrition supplement feeding programs. Wonderful. So just this large the environmental solution that is needed, and not just the single targeting. Thank you so much. And I'm looking at the time and we have um, so many questions, but I'm just going to pick one more for uh, Gerardo here. And it's from Schuler Marquez. And I think that's really interesting in relation to the meat industry. I've been wondering how a shift in global meat consumption might shift things or if we simply replace certain commodities for others without addressing the inequality. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think, I mean, th there are two kinds of issues here. I mean, on the one hand, th there's the food production system. On the other hand, there's inequality. And both have to be tackled with different kinds of policies. Because, I mean, you, you can shift the production system, but if you don't uh, modify inequality, you know, people will continue not to have access to, to the more nutritious food. So in the case of meat, it seems like uh, there's a big shift coming along. And I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but uh, I mean, th there's all these um, uh, clonated meat that is being experimented with. It's already being deployed in the market in, uh, I was gonna say, uh, in Singapore. In Singapore, they're already selling uh, meat that comes from stem cells, all right? So, I mean, theoretically, we could completely do away with cows in the case of uh, beef, right? Uh, but what is that going to do with all the processing? Ultra -pro I mean, th that's one shift. The other shift is that, I mean, all these uh, Beyond Burger and, you know, all these uh, uh, so-called plant-based uh, meats, uh, you know, that, that may represent a big shift, but I think 
I'm perhaps more skeptical about the plant-based meats because I think they are uh, completely installed in the whole problematic of trying to provide consumers with something that tastes the same as meat and it is ultra processed. And, and so it may not be that good for you. I mean, I've only had one uh, Beyond Burger meat and it was awful on my stomach. Then again, I have a particularly weak stomach, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm definitely not representative, but uh, it'd be interesting to see what these new meats do for you. So I think that opens a completely different and conversation maybe for the future in terms of the beyond the meat question. But unfortunately, we have run out of time and I just wanted to thank each of the panelists. Thank you, Janet and Gerardo and Emily for some truly fantastic presentations that really made us think about how we should frame hunger, how we should think about obesity and how the problems of metrics have such a long history both in our country and how our country has measured and seen the bodies of others beyond our borders, but especially food as a function beyond that that can be measured, but food as a function that helps us define others racially and in terms of not just the simply cons consuming for calories, but consuming also for identities across, across both societies and class and race. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we will be having other conversations. Please stay tuned and thank you for the panelists. Have a good evening. Bye.